everyone. I'm Serene Jones, and I'm the president of Union Theological Seminary, and I'm so excited that you have joined us for our inaugural James H. Cone Lecture. We've been looking forward to this for quite some time. We'd originally planned for this lecture to take place last April, and then COVID happened, and we were sadly forced to cancel it along with all of our other spring events. But now we are here. I realize that many of you are joining tonight because you knew Dr. Cohn, maybe you were taught by him, or you knew him as a friend and a colleague, or maybe you were inspired by his work and reading his books changed your life. For those of us who knew him well, during his 50 years, 50 years, 50 years of teaching at Union, we knew him as a serious committed scholar. He was a theologian all the way down to his bones. And he took the task of teaching students to think theologically extremely seriously. He would not abide lazy or fuzzy thinking when it came to the meaning of our lives and talk about God. And he was committed to black theology, to articulating theology as it has arisen out of the black experience in the United States, and also it, as it has again and again been articulated by liberation theologies globally. James Cone always listened to and powerfully engaged theological voices that white Protestant seminaries like Union had for centuries not just ignored or, or repressed or silenced, but gravely harmed. For those of you who know him, he was a complex and splendid individual, a father, a spouse, a son, a brother, a pastoral care presence, and a mentor who loved nothing more than sitting on his couch in McGifford and spending hours arguing theology, politics, culture, and asking generations of students really hard questions as a way of guiding them forward, questions that would make you uncomfortable. We are very proud that his archive is in the Burke Library here on campus. And if it were not for COVID, it would have been processed and open already for scholars to explore. At Union, we miss him dearly and daily. But we also have the joy of seeing his work being carried on in so many of his students who have found their own voices teaching around the globe. And even those who weren't taught by him, but have read his books and here at Union imbibed his spirit, you can see it, you can see it in our current students, many of you who are on Zoom with us right now. As I think about Union and our students, I want to take a moment to share for the first time some really great news about a new formal area of study, a concentration that we will be offering. While we've been offering classes for years that focus on black theology and the black church and indigenous African and Afro-Caribbean religious traditions, courses on the black social gospel, on black preaching, we never had a program area that pulled all of this deep richness together in a thoughtful and comprehensive way. Now we do. Beginning next semester, students can choose the area called Religion and the Black Experience as a concentration at Union. This concentration focuses on the transdisciplinary study of religious experience, ideas, practices, and theologies of African and African descended people. And the director is our new faculty member, the Reverend Dr. Timothy Atkins Jones, who is assistant professor of homiletics. We are so excited that he is with us and going to be directing this. And I wanna say a special word of thank you to our students who have pushed for and very much assisted in creating this new concentration. And for the many faculty at Union who teach in this area, 
Dr. Cohn would be thrilled. And now I would like to introduce, and I love doing this, I would like to introduce my close colleague and dear, dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of Episcopal Divinity School at Union, and also the Judith and Bill Moyers Chair of Theology. Now that's important because the Moyers Chair was first held when it was created by Dr. Cohn, who shared a lifelong friendship with Judith and Bill Moyers, also long-term friends of Union. And I am beyond thrilled that Kelly is now in that chair. In addition to being one of the leading prophetic public theological voices of this generation, she was also a student of and a close friend of Dr. Cohn and is a world-renowned theologian and scholar in her own right. For all these reasons, we have asked Dean Douglas to introduce our speaker, Dr. Penn, who I have to admit I have also known for close to 30 years, back when we were both starting out in the world of theology. So Dean Douglas, will you um, uh, get us going with our lecture tonight and then lead us in conversation after we hear Dr. Penn's lecture. Kelly? It's a privilege to do so, Serene, and thank you so much for uh, the introduction and for the opportunity uh, uh, to indeed uh, have this inaugural Dr. James Cone lecture. It's good to be here tonight, and I have been eagerly looking forward to our first Cone lecture. As you have said, Serene, uh, this lecture has particular meaning and significance uh, for me, not simply as a Union alum and now back here as uh, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union, as well as holder of the Bill and Judith Moyers Chair, but as one who was a student of Dr. Combs and uh, one who was a longtime mentee of Dr. Combs and indeed a friend. And so I am humbled as well as challenged to hold the chair which he held previously uh, to my being named in this chair and to carry forth the tradition of prophetic public theology. I am also particular, uh, particularly honored tonight to introduce our inaugural lecture, Dr. Anthony B. Penn. I have known Dr. Penn for many years and let's say some decades, but I got to know his work long, much before I met him. And what I saw in his work was an integrity of scholarship, an integrity of commitment to truth, an integrity of commitment to probing the mind, the intellect, the imagination. So indeed to not only get to a truth, but this integrity of probing that would allow us to understand more deeply, not only the meaning of our very existence, but to understand more deeply the project toward justice, toward freedom. When I met Dr. Penn in person, I came to realize that the integrity of his work was nothing less than a reflection of the integrity of his person. He is a person deeply committed, deeply committed to justice and deeply understanding the connection between intellectual rigor and the rigor that is, take, that is required for us to move toward a more just society. Dr. Penn's brilliance reflects the brilliance of his presence in the world. And so I have been honored and privileged that my journey has on this earth has crossed with his journey. And I count him as a brother and as a true friend. And so 
He is, he comes to us today as the Agnes Colin Arnold Professor of Humanities and Professor of Religion at Rice University. And he is the founding director of the Center for Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning, also at Rice. He is a humanist theologian. And for some that may seem like a surprising choice for a cone lecture speaker, but rest assured, Dr. Penn's research interests span the study of religion, black religious aesthetics, religion and popular culture. And as Dr. Penn may share, he and Dr. Cohn were, were friends and colleagues and had intense conversations about Dr. Penn's work. And if anyone, as people who know Dr. Cohn know, he never liked people just to be complacent, at, but he pushed us all to find our voice and to begin to use our own theological and intellectual imagination to create new paradigms to move us closer toward this more just world and society that he and Dr. Penn are indeed committed to. And so I know that Dr. Cohn respected greatly Dr. Penn finding his voice in humanist thought. And so tonight, without further ado, I would like to introduce and present to you Dr. Penn, who will deliver for us a lecture titled, The View from Bearden, James Cohn, Black Suffering and Theologizing Poetic Imagination. Dr. Anthony Penn. President Jones, Dean Douglas, all of the union family that made this evening possible, thank you so very much. I'm humbled by the invitation and friends, I am honored by your presence. I have to tell you, this has weighed on me. It's weighed on me in a good way. It's weighed on me because I owe Dr. Cohn a debt of gratitude. When I moved from Buffalo, New York to New York City and was going to study religion, one of the first books I read on black religion was Cohn's A Black Theology of Liberation. His words stuck with me. They had the kind of impact on me that hip hop culture was having on me. Both cone and hip hop encouraged me to think creatively and to give the people I love the best I have to offer. I didn't formally study with cone, but I read him and wrestled with him from a distance. And as you know, he's gracious. So over the course of time, he was more than willing to engage me in conversation. New York is the place I've always felt most comfortable. So I've tried to get to New York every opportunity. And when I would get there, Cone would have breakfast with me. And those were special moments for me. I'd come with all of my questions and concerns. I wanted to know more about theology, but I wanted to also know how to do theology. And he was gracious with all these questions. He left us before I got to ask one Last question. I had a question I wanted to bring to Cone. Yet despite my intentions, it's one I failed to ask. It isn't a particularly unique question. In fact, versions of it are common, at least endemic to theological reflection related to our evolving social circumstances. Still, at this post-election moment, it has an existential imperative, not new, but surely intensified through a concern for the construction of democratic life in the aftermath of graphic and vile attacks. As I plan to ask it, the question is premised on a dire awareness of the scope and depth of anti-Black racism, long marking the idea of the United States. It's a question holding a particularly suffocating grip and intensity made all the more challenging as of 2016. Now I'm not suggesting the Trump presidency as a metaphor for the end of politics or for the end of a particular history of the Republic. 
but rather that it was a fuller representation, a defiant pronouncement of a long-standing structuring of violence as the content of power relations within the public sphere. The Trump effect, as thinkers like ta Coates described it, was tied to the very operating system defining this geography from the initial arrival of whites to the violent displacement and cold-blooded murder of Native Americans, to the enslavement and dehumanization of Africans. In a sense, the Trump effect simply represented a sloppy systemic reboot post-President Obama by means of which the grammar and performance of racialized violence is exposed for what it is, all while the system reestablishes itself. Trump supporters yelled the catchphrase for this reboot and wore it emblazoned on red caps, make America great again. Whether one calls the resulting political mood the threat of fascism encouraged by a troubling populism or simply a glitch in democratic practice. For certain populations, this is semantics. The political history of the United States, including recent examples of a vile response to difference, make such distinctions of limited value. In either case, violence and death have been a strategy used to support a normative framing of restricted life. And so I would suggest Trump's presidency marks the death of a certain vision of democracy. And it made hard to maintain any claim of distinctiveness. It exposed the fallacy of progress. That is to say with Trump, a narrative of mutuality dies. And as so many have pointed out, it takes a certain expression of theism with it. In a word, Trumpism had not only socio-political and economic connotations and consequences, it had cultural impact as well. Wrapped in the cultural trauma produced is religion and with religion, theology. Mindful of all this, and trying to make some sense of a possible public face for our shared academic and theological commitments, I ask now the question I would have liked to pose to Dr. Cohn. What of black theology in the age after Trump? The basic concern lodged in this question would have been all too familiar to Dr. Cohn. Versions of the question both implicitly and explicitly haunt his theologizing. He asked a form of it in, a, in light of a other, no less significant historical moment. And I said, I wasn't gonna tell nobody we find this quarry. What if anything is theology worth in the black struggle in America? And some 50 years earlier, he phrased the same concern this way. How do we dare speak of God in a suffering world? A world in which blacks are humiliated simply because they are black. Put yet another way, one that marks the continuity of social concern over time from Bearden to Harlem, he wrote in the cross in the lynching tree, if God loves black people, why then do we suffer so much? That was my question as a child, that is still my question, end quote. At this point, rather than an explicit turn to theodicy, which as many of you know, would be my tendency, I want to use the question, what of black theology in the age after Trump as a way of calling attention to the workings of imagination that both shapes Cone's narration of black life and serves as a theoretical device for theologizing at the end of theodicy. In this case, poetic justice, as he called it, is a hermeneutical tool as well as how and why that tool is held. Having in mind this context, during our time together, my aim is to use this question to address briefly two concerns. First, a preliminary genealogy of imagination as it develops in relationship to Cone's early attention to the black moralist tradition by which I mean to highlight a mode of critique targeting hypocrisy and systemic practices and strategies of harm. It's a mindful critique without offering an explicit fix. For the sake of clarity, I am proposing 
One might think of this imagination as Cone's use as early as black theology and black power of a theologized black moralist sensibility drawn from his read of Richard Wright and Albert Camus. And second, I aim to suggest some implications for this hermeneutical move in relationship to black suffering and hope. Now to be clear, my linking of Cone to the black moralist tradition is not to suggest he was a closeted, agnostic, humanist, or atheist. One more time. It is not to suggest he was a closeted, agnostic, humanist, or atheist. Far from it. Rather, it is to point out what I think is a recognized but seldom discussed influence on his theological thought. One that conditions his sense of religiosity and religiosity's encounter with the world. Now, I'm not suggesting Cohn accepts Wright's anti-theological sensibilities or Camus' theological exclusions. And still, when presenting the theological possibility of Black moralism, Cohn exhibits a somewhat unusual ease with disbelief. He understands its possibility tied to existential misery and distinguishes it from arrogance of the Western humanist tradition when saying, and I quote, if the affirmation of God's death grows out of one's identity with suffering, then it's reasonable, perhaps necessary. But if it arises out of one's identity with an advancing technological secular society, which ignores the reality of God and the humanity of man, then it appears to be the height of human pride, end quote. The link between Cone and black moralism is at least in part existential, entailing an unflinching encounter with suffering and a wrestling with its significance. Furthermore, Cone's mood or posture toward work in the world and his hermeneutical sensibilities share with Wright and Camus an awareness of toxic sociality tied to the dynamics of disregard coloring all engagement. For all three, religion figured significant. Only for Wright and Camus, its metaphysical hold is addressed through negation. They are unable to deny religion, rather they oppose it and its assumptions. Cone, on the other hand, tames but does not destroy its more fantastic claims by measuring them against the ongoing realness of black suffering. Religion involves something of an oversaturation of meaning an effort to more than signify circumstances of existential life, but rather to rethink them so as to heighten the nature and meaning of, as he names it, black being in the world. Now this of course is not without its limits and that like the moralist, Cone seems to appreciate the paradoxical nature of engagement, the failure of certain universals, but the prescribed and compelling nature of the particular. And through story, through story, individual struggle is connected to the resistance of a larger collective. Black story becomes more than subjective to the extent it is historical. Such recounting of the conditions of life was of importance to Cohn from the start of his effort to theologize beyond Bart moving forward. The view of black life from Bearden made such conditions graphically clear and his home training made it impossible to ignore. It is the tenacious and uncompromising concern with dynamics of black suffering as real suffering that draws Cone to Richard Wright. The expression of encounter with the world and lucid engagement with the rawness of experience sung in the blues and expressed on the page. Cone gathers from Wright's description and narration of death's dynamics the threat of existential termination, calculated in terms of what Cone would label the ethics of living Jim Crow. Reflecting on texts such as 12 Million Black Voices, Cone secures a graphic sense of misery as the intrinsic nature of racial disregard and violent encounter as the very meaning of the United States as a nation. Yet for Cone, as well as Wright, to resist is to live, and to live is to resist. In other words, Wright affirms what Cone knows to be true. Black life entails persistence, a defiant 
preservation despite circumstances. Through Wright, Cohn is further encouraged to connect personal experience and theologizing. Concerning this, Cohn says, if Richard Wright is correct in his contention that expressing, expression springs out of an environment, then I must conclude that my theological reflections are inseparable from the Bearden experience, end quote. As with Wright, the moralist, writing became for Cohn a means of protest, an engagement with the world along new linguistic lines. For both, this impulse speaks a contextual relationship, the manner in which social circumstances of the author informed the presentation of systemic concerns and solutions. Wright provides for Cohn a graphic depiction of black life, life, a sense of misery, but also the persistence of black life as critique. On a related note, Cohn's regard for black power as a humanizing force and new strategy for structuring vibrant living encourage robust engagement with black moralist sensibilities. Think along these lines. Camus' rebel easily lend itself to a type of action a push against existing structures of intimidation and confinement without simply replacing them with other similar devices of oppression. According to Cohn, the social analysis and philosophy of existence undergirding black power is akin to Camus' posture as it is marked by counter distinction. The rebel, Cohn reflects on Camus' book by the same name, says no and yes. No to the conditions considered intolerable, and yes to that something within him which is worthwhile and which must be taken into consideration." End quote. Advocates of Black power, according to Cohn, share with Camus rebel an understanding that death on one's own terms is better than life shaped by the whim of oppressors. There is something in this existential push that for Cohn constitutes profound recognition of black personhood, of human status as an agent within a world determined to create black bodies as objects. Using black power as a normative strategy by means of which the dominant civil rights movement's rhetoric can be reconceived. And again, in comparison to Camus, Cohn says, it is in light and in this light that the slogan freedom now ought to be interpreted. Like Camus' phrase, all or nothing, freedom now means that the slave is willing to risk death because he considers these rights more important than himself, end quote. This turn to a theologized black moralism allows a deconstruction of death, a recasting of it not as a terrorizing threat by whiteness, but rather a demand by black people for significance in the form of self-determination. To move through life in line with the dictates of the social world is for Cohn the equivalent of ontological suicide. It is to acquiesce to degrading conditions that negate what one believes of oneself. He writes, if we accept white definitions of blackness, we destroy ourselves. And as I understand Cohn to be implying, such is the case because by surrendering to the conditions of existence, one embraces the social world as a true statement on black value. However, struggle is to push against the world inscribed by whiteness. It's a push to make the world other than it is. And for Cohn, black theology is a vocabulary and grammar for this black rebellion. Embodied existence, what Camus would call flesh, is the geography of life its placement in time and space, the measure of the present. Think about this claim in relationship to God of the oppressed, where the theologian's role remains measured by existential conditions and that the theologian is, according to Cohn, an exegete of experience. That is to say, the theologian is one whose posture always leans towards the world, a material experience defining that world. This is for Cohn an organic process of evaluation drawn from black history or the rhythm and feels lodged, for example, in artistic reflection. In music, for instance, misery is not abstraction. 
Rather, it conditions and informs what can be said and the dynamics of what can be done in the world and for the world. Mindful of this framing, both the spirituals and the blues signify the world. Both find happiness within the midst of despair as they reflect people confronted by misery, but not defeated. It is with the tension between demand to be recognized and related to as a person and a counter determination to project black bodies as less than human that one encounters Cone's sense of Camusian absurdity. The silence of the world in response to the human call for meaning, the human call for answers to the fundamental dilemmas of life. We, Cone announces, are seeking meaning. We're seeking meaning in a world permeated with philosophical and theological absurdities where hope is non-existent, end quote. For Camus, the absurd exists in the absence of God. And for Cohn, the situation is more theologically nuanced. Theology, despite other possibilities, remains God talk for Cohn. The absurd then exists in the unresolved issue of black suffering known to God. Cone's theological wrestling with black suffering is shadowed by Camus' yes, no proposition. A shift from certainty to recognition of mutuality be between affirmation and negation. What one encounters here is Cone's conditioning of black moralism through a radical marker of meaning beyond the scope of troubled human history. A consistency of presence that pushes against but doesn't resolve the absurdity of life within the context of the lynching tree. All is read and processed in light of the circumstances faced by the oppressed who become the measure of truth. As Cohn understands the Bible, for example, even it, a significant source for the doing of black theology to be sure, does not authorize rejection or bracketing of existential circumstances and conditions of life. And this is why Cohn can say, the gospel offers no assurance of winning. The idea of winning is a hang up of white liberals who want to be white and Christian at the same time. That is according to Cone, God is neither nature nor our highest aspiration. God is always more than our experience of God. This means that truth is not limited to human capabilities. It is this reality that frees the rebel to give all for the liberation struggle without having to worry about the Western concept of winning." End quote. For Cohn, there's something about engaging the world or again, what he calls being in the world that sustains struggle and points out the realness of black humanity that captures dimensions of blackness or black being beyond the rhetoric and performance of whiteness. It is not the answer to the question of suffering that his faith is lodged, but rather in the ability to persist in spite of this unresolvable philosophical, theological, and ultimately existential question of being. I want to note an effective consideration also at work. It's an effective dimension having to do with the assumption reason alone is insufficient to capture our circumstances and that non-linguistic performance of power is significant. And in turn, this encourages deep appreciation for the embodied demands of theological inquiry. Furthermore, theology is symbolic, which according to Cohn is to say, it is not anti-rational, but it is non-rational, transcending the world of rational discourse and pointing to a realm of reality that can only be grasped by means of the imagination, end quote. It has a poetic quality to it, which allows it to probe experience and discern the limits of expression. It is through the privileging of imagination, as we shall see, that Cohn rethinks theological obligation to provide answers to the existential challenges defining life in the world. Mindful of the problem of theodicy in particular, Cone writes and said, I wasn't gonna tell nobody. I knew I had no answer for the problem of suffering. I wasn't actually looking for one. Since answers only stifle the imagination and cover up the deeper existential questions. <laughs> 
Herein again is the absurd for Cohn, not in the nature of blackness, but quote, in the effort to reconcile being with the white world, end quote. Cohn, like moralists before his writing, maintained the importance of suffering. They thought and worked in light of suffering, but without ultimate resolution. Perhaps Cohn comes to understand theodicy as a mode of theological absurdity akin to the political absurdity by which Camus means, quote, a state's insistence to give meaning to the unjustifiable suffering it inflicts on its citizens, end quote. Cohn's interpretive norm of black struggle emerges in relationship to his theologizing of imagination or what he called poetic imagination. And I name in light of his engagement with Wright and Camus, a theologized black moralist imagination. Here imagination comes to be an organic hermeneutical principle determining the shape and content of black theological thought and claims. I call it organic in that it stems from the experience and existential condition of black people as Cone approached and understood them. He makes graphic the nature and content of black suffering while downplaying assumptions concerning the merits of whiteness as a structuring of reality. While Cone spoke of new visions of black life, this turn to imagination as a technology is significant for his perspective on persistent suffering. Suffering, he writes, always poses the deepest test of faith, radically challenging its authenticity and meaning. No rational explanation can soothe the pain of an aching heart and troubled mind. In the face of the lynching death of an innocent child, black Christians could only reach into the depth of the religious imagination for a transcendent meaning that could take them through despair to a hope beyond tragedy, end quote. This strategy of imagination pulls towards others with a degree of deep regard and is submerged in the muck of the material world so as to uncover the depths of human suffering without being subdued by what is found. When theologized, imagination, according to Cohn, is the only way to talk truthfully about ultimate reality. Cohn's technique of poetic imagination is akin to Camus' moral imagination. In either case, with either qualifier, there is a concern with lucidity, that is awareness beyond social codes and cultural misrepresentations. Both are informed, the former through a theological impulse, by a mode of rigorous questioning that seeks to expose and challenge hypocrisy. Cohn argues, and this is important, quote, one has to have a powerful a religious imagination to see redemption in the cross, to discover life in death and hope in tragedy, end quote. Cohn speaks about the poetic quality of imagination in relationship to the creativity of the arts. But there's another sense in which imagination is reflected in Cohn's work as poetic. That is to say, there is something poetic about imagination as Cohn describes it, poetic to the extent it involves signifying or the destruction of language of signs and symbols so as to free them to do a different type of work and to tell a different story. Perhaps there is something about the silence of the world to Black's performance of personhood that makes necessary art. Or in the words of Camus, if the world were clear, art would not exist. It is this recognition that pushes Cohn in the direction of the tutorial of artists. These artists, like Wright, provide signs of a rethought language through an improvised grammar and vocabulary of life. And while I hope we will spend some time during the Q&A talking through the manner in which this language shapes struggle in masculine terms and assumes perhaps a particular gendering of experience, for now, I'll simply say this language speaks of the present, its pain and misery, and does so without surrender. 
Artists offer imaginative frameworks that signify teleological projections and instead demonstrate the power of blackness performed. Art in this regard gives effectual expression to lucidity, naming the absurd as such and pushing against it. Regarding this work, Cohn pronounces, I believe that all aspiring black intellectuals share the task that Leroy Jones has described for the black artist in America to aid in the destruction of America as he knows it. The working of imagination doesn't entail full removal of his inherited theological vocabulary, but rather the degrading of that language, the signification of its traditional intent so as to expose the value of contradiction, the value of paradox. There's something about this interrogation of language, the poetics of blackness that merits recognition to the extent it points to a hermeneutic beyond suspicion, entailing a perspective that over the course of normative arrangements of life might come off as mad. In fact, as Cohn writes, one has to be a little mad, kind of crazy, to find salvation in the cross, victory in defeat, and life in death. While I pointed to his later writings, Cohn recognized as early as Black theology and Black power that language must reflect existential circumstances. It must be drawn from the experiences of a people. And as a consequence, language changes over time. The grammar of life reflects evolving circumstances. So when thinking about the development of Black theolo theology as a formal enterprise, Cohn says, times have changed and the current situation demands a language appropriate for the problems we now face. Symbols must reflect the existential arrangements of life as lived. Furthermore, in The Cross and the Lynching Tree, Cohn writes the cross and the lynching tree can help us to know from where we have come and where we must go. We continue to seek an ultimate meaning that cannot be expressed in rational and historical language and that cannot be denied by white supremacy. Through poetic imagination, we can see the God of Jesus revealed in the cross and the lynching tree. Those who saw this connection more clearly than others were artists, poets, and writers." End quote. Cohn uses artists to articulate and perform the existential and ontological entanglements that are blackness in a white world. But why is this the case? He writes, artists force us to see things we do not want to look at because they make us uncomfortable with ourselves and the world we have created. And he goes on to say, more than anyone, artists demonstrate our understanding of the need to represent the beauty and the terror of our people's experience, end quote. Mindful of his words, one way, what one gets with Cohn, particularly his most recent work, is a push toward a heightened appreciation for critique, for the pointing out of hypocrisy, which is the very nature of moralism, and a sensitivity to suffering as outside the scope of temporality proper. Cohn castigates black thinkers and ministers for failure of imagination, the lack of a critical type of imagination, which is central in that it takes, Cohn says, a powerful imagination grounded in historical experience to, un to uncover the great mystery of black life. And the turn to the poetic imagination exemplified by the arts is vital here in that as Camus notes, art forges a way of experiencing and describing rather than explaining and solving. Artists reflect in graphic detail the nature of black life within a death dealing society and they do so without surrendering the truth of black experience. Art was a touchstone for Cohn in reflecting as he proclaims the heartbeat of black life. How could it not be in light of his take on the nature of artistic engagement? What Nina Simone said about an artist Cohn reflects expressed my feeling about a theologian. How can you be an artist and not reflect the times? That to me is the definition of an artist, a theologian too, end quote. Herein is found a difference between imagination exercised by artists and wishing, which marks the substance of some sermonic and academic reflection on black experience. 
while the former poetic imagination destroys and reconstitutes signs and symbols so as to honor experience, the latter, the wish, bends experience to the non-historical. And as Cohn said often, it lacks passion. Poetic imagination, or in the case of Cohn, theologized black moralist imagination, and tells something of an irreverent depiction of life that doesn't dismiss what Bakhtin would call degraded dimensions of experience, which are the places of deep and rich materiality, of a deep and robust attention to the substance of life, while the latter, the wish, shifts quickly to vertical relationships, to God for the sermon, an abstraction for the academic. For Cohn, these wishes geared toward vertical considerations lend very little to and poorly reflect the magnitude of historical engagement. A critique of whiteness in thought and practice involves a shift and that according to Cohn, to be human in a condition of social oppression involves affirming that which the oppressor regards as degrading, end quote. The artist explores the sacred within the ordinary, sacred because it seeks to struggle against the absurd and in that struggle, name black being as transformative. According to Wright, it is vital to have more than perspective. That is to say a position from which to view historical experience. The writer must experience that experience and thereby know something of the social and emotional milieu that gives tone and solidity of detail. Themes for Negro writers, he makes clear, will emerge when they have begun to feel the meaning of the history of their race as though they in one lifetime have lived it themselves throughout the long centuries, end quote. Or as Camus suggests, imagination opens one to actual suffering in the world, how it is described and experienced and proposes ethics as more than reflection or abstract denouncement. Artistic presentation of black life challenges conceptual frameworks and theological assertions in such a way as to always privilege the materiality of life or what Cohn calls at times the social basis of theology, which speaks to the doing of theology in a way that reflects the significance and centrality of marginalized experience. Still, art doesn't resolve, it exposes. It doesn't eliminate tension, it contextualizes it. This is an important move for Cohn, for a theologian who has shifted from firm presentation of answers to the existential trauma of theodicy. What I mean to suggest here is a shift in thought, away from fixation on the content of the theodical question to a poetic manipulation of its form. Cohn, for example, in his short, very short reply to William R. Jones, founding God of the Oppressed, frames black theology's response to theodicy in the form of the Christ event. From that response, it's clear Cohn's Christology grounds what can be said about God in relationship to human suffering. And while Jesus Christ remains significant for Cohn, after all, he is a Christian, the theologized black moralist imagination he employs shifts concern from credo and doctrinal articulations of black suffering to a deconstruction of its form, how the underlying question is configured and how each black person shares in that crucifixion. It is worth noting this depiction of Christ's suffering is reflected and reflecting our suffering isn't isolated to Cohn or even black theology. But it is also reflected in the thought of Camus, who says, quote, he is not the God man, but the man God. And like him, each of us can be crucified and victimized and is to a certain degree, end quote. Answering the theodical question is no longer concerned. Rather, this imaginative approach privileges what we can learn about ourselves by the way the question is deconstructed. Cohn highlights a central element of theodical reflection when thinking black theology over against existentialist rejection of God and Christianity. Cohn writes, black theology affirms that there is nothing special about the English word God in itself, 
What is important is the dimension of reality to which it points. The word God is a symbol that opens up depths of reality in the world. If the symbol loses its power to point to the meaning of black liberation, then we must destroy it. Black theology asks whether the word God has lost its liberating power. Must we say that as a meaningful symbol, the word God is hopelessly dead and cannot be resurrected, end quote. His theological preoccupation with black suffering in relation to notions of the divine in the form of theodicy goes through a variety of iterations. And still, Cone concludes the theodicy question as usually presented, isn't the right question for those addressing black suffering. Theodicy tends to privilege the preservation of a conceptual field as opposed to diving deep into the misery marking the world. Yet, such a tension between suffering and potentiality is mitigated through his theologized black moralist imagination. One, for instance, might link Camus' encouragement that we imagine Sisyphus happy to Cone's assumption struggle is useful and productive. God in this context shifts in terms of philosophical argument. At times moving away from constituting a being to constituting a positioning of the oppressed, a mode of insight and resistance, a naming of a posture of rightful defiance. God in this case entails the constitution of what the theologized black moralist imagination seeks to represent. God is a framing for lucidity in the service of liberation. In 1970, Cone remarked that, in the struggle for truth in a revolutionary age, there can be no principles of truth, no absolutes, not even God. For we realize that though the reality of God must be the presupposition of theology, the very name implies this, we cannot speak of God at the expense of the oppressed. Or in even more graphic terms, the task of black theology, he writes, is to kill gods that do not belong to the black community, end quote. There is something of a tension here regarding doctrine of God. What seems a shift from a God somewhat easily distinguished from human desire, at least white desire and need, and God practically defined only in relationship to human, really black experience. I note that theological slippage, if this isn't too strong a term, as present early and late in his writing. In God of the Oppressed, for instance, he seeks something of a theological middle ground. God's reality, Cone writes, can never be reduced merely to human goals and struggles in the historical sphere. The divine is more than what we think, perceive, and dream at any moment in time. It is this more or otherness in divine reality that makes it necessary for theology to recognize its conceptual limitations. This is the key conceptual limitations. One might say God functions as a way to name this limitation, where language is inadequate to capture the depth of human experience, there is God. This recognition of conceptual limitations spoken as God is a more forceful pronouncement of how God is known. God is known in and through experience of blackness. This is because as Cone argues, blackness and divinity are dialectically bound together as one reality. How could it be otherwise, he announces, when theological thinking about things divine is closely intertwined with the manifestations of actual life? Being grounded in the existential circumstances of black life, what we might call dynam dynamic blackness, modifies the nature of God to such an extent that to speak of God is to speak of human history. Hence, to borrow and modify Feuerbach, Cohn says theology is anthropology, and he means it as a call to the anthropological grounding for our claims and assertions. Humanity then from early in his work moving forward is the point of departure, the existential referent for anything worthy of the name black theology. In this way, Black theology is existentially based and articulates an effort on the part of the oppressed in his terms to be in spite of non-being. 
Black theology, like other modalities of resistance, addresses in Cone's words, the hardness of life, the absurdity of being black in a crazy white world. God remains viable and more for Cone, yet he is quick to qualify the nature of God symbol. The sole purpose, he notes, of God and Black theology is to illuminate the Black condition so that Blacks can see that their liberation is the manifestation of God's activity. Such is a God, unlike the static and unifying symbol rejected by Camus, it is not the God castigated by right. What Cohn offers is more than a statement regarding who does theological work. Rather, he provides grounding for theology's content and claims, such as existence of first order and the rejection of universal humanity. As we've seen, he is close in his thinking to Camus and Wright. They are connected in part because of their shared sensitivity to and firsthand knowledge of the tragic quality of life, as well as being linked through Cone's appeal to a common value for humanity that motivates rebellion and that serves as a common sign of meaning. Yes, there is a common value to human being, but there is no universal ethic through which this value can be safeguarded. While embracing a black moralist sense of imagination, Cone's theological commitments fall short of a full embrace of moralist epistemology. Camus, for instance, rejects certainty and tames talk of future. But Cone maintains a sense of struggle as meaningful, more than an imagining of happiness. When he says, if God is truly the God of and for the oppressed for the purpose of their liberation, then the future must mean that our fight for freedom has not been naught. Our journey in the world cannot be a meaningless thrust toward an unrealizable future, but a certainty grounded in the past and present reality of God. To grasp for the future of God is to know that those who die for freedom have not died in vain. They will see the kingdom of God without a meaningful analysis of the future, all is despair, end quote. Should this statement be read as Cone pushing against full recognition of absurdity and its significance? Keep in mind the words of Camus. It is possible to be Christian and absurd. What is required is for the Christian to critique notions of the future in light of existential circumstances, to see and center the importance, the value of struggle. In this regard, Cohn is the absurd theologian of a kind, which is to be marked by a consciousness of circumstances that privilege awareness through theological categories and signs that bend to the demand for lucidity. For Cohn, Camus' idea that the world offers no truths wouldn't disturb, and that the world for Cohn is the social world that both defines and affirms whiteness. And how could a world framed by the lie of white supremacy offer anything that would qualify as truth? To be to the contrary, truth is found in the struggle against the world. Something about blackness constitutes truth. The absurd prompts for Camus the question of death, of suicide. For Cohn, black life is entangled with death. And so the question for Cohn isn't first one of death over against life, but rather the nature of hope. Or what can be said within the context of a theological system done for people surrounded by death. Persistence is achieved by recognition that ours is a worldly battle against material and structural truck, uh, uh, social structures. In the struggle, Cohn finds joy and sings along with the spirituals and the blues, announcing presence in the world and the dignity of blackness despite the world. And so, even as he theologically modifies it, dimensions of moralism fit Cohn to the extent he rejects traditional theological formulations of future life, for example, otherworldly orientations, and thinks in robust terms about the present. 
Through Cohn's application of imagination, one deciphers a sense in which future is a way of naming struggle against current conditions. Hence, it is a structured rebellion against the wild conditions of life. The defined fable, to use Camus' language, is rejected by Cohn and in its place is a historically situated narrative of human activity, ever mindful of the conditions of the present and always committed to the push against physical as well as metaphysical death. In this push for a different materiality, one encounters the so-called kingdom of God as reconstituted mundane circumstances free of anti-Black racism, for example, and premised on the enthralling nature of Blackness. In this case, I would argue future doesn't constitute a different time, a different location, but rather an alternate way of looking at struggle in the present, a critique of circumstances that aren't resolved. This is one way to read Cohn's remark, and I quote, liberation as a future event is not simply otherworldly, but is the divine future that breaks into their social existence, bestowing wholeness in the present, situations of pain and suffering enabling black people to know that the existing state of oppression contradicts their very humanity, their real humanity is defined by God's future, end quote. Perhaps liberation doesn't end misery and suffering, but rather recast it, rejecting whiteness, embracing ontological blackness, thereby serving as a type of lucidity that points out the injustice of the moment, the existential circumstances as oppressive, and urges action. Cohn early in Black theology and Black power raises a question in passing, but one over which I want to linger as I prepare to end this talk. He writes, to say that this book is written in anger and disgust without denying a certain dark joy is to suggest that it is not written chiefly for Black people. At least it is not a handbook or a collection of helpful hints on conducting a revolution. No one can advise another on when and how to die. This is a word to the oppressor, a word to Whitey, not in hope that he will listen. After King's death, who can hope? There's something in this statement that speaks the imposition of one's being on structures that seek to deny agency and ontological significance. It is confrontation of a metaphysical sort, but there is something here, something here in this defense against non-being status for self and others. I want to get at this something else, this something here by pausing, by lingering over a bracketed line in the quotation I've just offered. Here's where I stop for a moment with the question embedded in Cohn's statement. After King's death, who can hope? Again, who can hope? I understand Cohn raises this question when discussing the ability or willingness of whites to listen to words of critique and correction, but it lends itself to a larger consideration regarding the nature of hope, the parameters for what black theology can say about hope at a time like ours. And so I'd like to end with a word concerning the sense of hope generated here. A sense of hope perhaps enabled by Cohn's theologized black moralist imagination. First, hope framed in this manner isn't refusal to see the world as it is, but rather, as Cohn would argue, it involves impatience with such a world, a protest against the world, a type of theological reminder of oppressive circumstances so as to foster discomfort and a graphic no to injustice. It is a disruption an existentially grounded push against circumstances from within those circumstances. Black theology, Cohn argues in 1969, has hope for this life. The appeal, he continues, to the next life is a lack of hope. Cohn, reminiscent of Camus, argues an effort to turn away from the existential conditions of a people is a mode of surrender, surrender to absurdity, whereas, as Cohn means it, Hope involves confrontation or push against absurdity grounded in the stuff of life lived. Black theological hope then is the will to see the world and recognize its silence through a tenacious commitment to rebellion against circumstances. Such hope as Cone writes, isn't what Camus called hope of a promised land, but rather a mood of defiance played out through action and deed. 
This hopelessness is a sense of appeal that in the words of Camus isn't justified. I'd put the statement in relationship to Cohn's turn to the blues, a language of existential trauma signified, which is the language of a people who quote, knew that their hope was hopeless. And it was out of this that the blues was born, the apex of se sensual despair. A strange and emotional joy is found in contemplating the blackest as aspects of life, end quote. Future Foucault is a pragmatic projection unleashed to foster attention to current circumstances, to provide discontent and rebellion within regions of oppression. What is of great interest here is the shift in Cohn away from animated reliance on ultimate victory for Blacks through the Christ event, God's ultimate answer to Black suffering. This outcome-driven theological ethical platform is replaced through a moralistic sensibility that privileges rebellion over against resolution and lodges any salvific quality in the existential presence of Blackness. In short, Blackness is salvific. In his second theological text, The Black Theology of Liberation, Cohn has this to say, Black theology responding to the Black condition takes on the character of rebellion against things as they are. In the writings of Camus, the rebel is one who refuses to accept the absurd conditions of things, but fights against them in spite of the impossibility of arriving at a solution. In Black theology, Blacks are encouraged to revolt against the structures of white social and political power by affirming Blackness. And the next statement by Cohn is key. Not because Blacks have a chance of winning. What could the concept of winning possibly mean? Blacks, and one must pay close attention to these following words, do what they do because and only because they can do no other. And Black theology says simply that such action is in harmony with divine revelation, end quote. It is interesting that Cohn moves from Camus' sense of rebellion to Black theology as revelation. Such is a political move that establishes an alternate paradigm, one that can't help but reflect the inner logic of what it replaces. Still, even Cohn's discussion of God's identification with Black misery reflects his attention to moralist thought when saying, quote, as Camus has pointed out, authentic identification is not a question of psychological identification, a mere subterfuge by which the individual imagines that he himself is being oppressed. It is identification of one's identity, one's destiny with that of others and a choice of sides, end quote. This defining of relationship or of ontological blackness guides Cohn and speaks to the form of hope available to him. God of the oppressed speaks of hope and transformation of circumstances as pointing to the future, to a thinking and arrangement of life more deserved, so to speak. Yet over time, the nature of this hope and the context of future are modified and they come to represent perspective and mood. A particularly strong focus on the present as the nature of hope, the future as that which cannot be named. That is to say, a type of critique of present circumstances and struggle against those circumstances. In a sense, future will come to connote for Cone's sustained rejection of the present material of life. It is the volume and persistence of rebellion as a hell no to ex existential conditions as they are. Hence, hope is the structure of struggle. Put differently, hope emerges from an informed struggle. As he reflects in speaking the truth, there is no strong distinction between the two, between hope and struggle. Perhaps as Cohn would know, this is what Camus means when connecting hope with fecundity. That is the ability to, the ability despite circumstances to generate continued action, to persist in struggle despite all. Finally, it wouldn't be wrong to say the lynching tree holds a theological power for Cohn, connoting both, and I quote, tragic and hopeful reality that, is, uh, that sustains and empowers black people to resist the forces that seem destined and designed to destroy every ounce of dignity in their souls and bodies, end quote. 
drawing on his liberation center read of salvific history chronicled in the biblical text, hope, he writes, comes by way of defeat. This same receptive approach to misery informs the ability of blacks to persevere in the face of ongoing disregard in the form of injustice. There is with hope a theological irreverence or perhaps even a theological perversity in that it entails the location of meaning along the margins, a defiant and knowing smile in the face of absurdity and adversity, the rhythm and sway of the blues that refuse to be subdued. And so finally, thinking about our circumstances in light of this defiant refusal. In the last published words written to us, America has hit the jackpot and doesn't even know it. Cone concludes, we like Baldwin need to embrace our diversity with joy, knowing that we are stronger and better as a nation when we embrace the weak, the least in our midst. That's why, that's what makes me proud to be an American an African-American. What a blessing. Thank you so much. Thank you. The disadvantage of virtual uh, realities is that you can't hear the applause and receive the ovation as you should. But thank you, Dr. Penn, for such a penetrating, thoughtful, uh, and uh, inspiring lecture that leaves us with many things to talk about and we won't get to all of it here. We have a short time. So I'm gonna jump in uh, with uh, a couple of questions and remind those who are listening to please place your questions in the Q&A. We have uh, one there already, but let me start with a couple of uh, questions. Uh, to you. I'm going to sort of frame a question that takes us from the beginning uh, and then to the end of hope, and then we'll uh, open it up. You speak of theology as Cohn did, uh, as that, and the theologian is sort of being the, an exegete of experience, right? But it's about more than that, because Cohn, as he posits in his theological work and talks about the importance of Black experience, he actually posits Black experience and Black history as sort of, as you allude to at the end, as a salvation history. Mm -hmm. That is that God is working in it and God's working and moving in Black experience, moving through Black history, not just in terms of understanding or taking on suffering, but also in terms of a movement toward liberation. So now this leads me to sort of two quick things. First, it's therefore not simply, it seems to me, for Cone, not simply about the poetic imagination, but it's about the theological imagination that is lodged in Black faith, right? And this is a word I know that, that, that didn't, didn't come up uh, in your, <laughs> this, this reality of black faith. So it's not simply the artist that Cone turns toward uh, in doing his theology, but it's those black folk that are sitting in the pew. So it, or, so it's, and it's not simply then black experience, qua black experience, but it's about the black faith experience. And so that when he talks about God, it's, yes, the word is a symbol, but he's talking about something behind that symbol that is real, right? That then makes the black experience, a, 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 a black history sort of salvation history, and that centers faith so that theology then really does become faith seeking understanding. So with the, can you speak to that? That's a whole lot. I'm going to do my best. I, I, First, I'd offer a secular amen, that you, there isn't much you said that I would disagree with. In, in terms of the theologian as an exegete of experience, I would hold to that and qualify it, right? It, it, it seems to me it's that framing that allows Cone, as a sure enough Christian, to claim theology, and me as a secular humanist to claim theology. Here's where I would qualify it. That work has a particular charge, 
It has a particular community of accountability and it has a particular source material. And, and so when you talk in terms of faith and it being grounded in faith, I would argue that it's that, that work draws from the energy, the stories, the narratives, the thinking of that faith community. And in that turn to the faith community fosters a kind of organic vocabulary and grammar used to express what that exegetical moment uncovers. So I don't know that we're disagreeing there. The, the question becomes the context in which that work is done. Yeah, it, and, and it, yes. And, but also a little more than that, because he's also speaking of something, a transcendent reality that is real, that is moving through uh, to, uh, the black experience that brings me to this latter question and, and, and we'll turn to uh, the questions in the box. And that, so if that is the case, Dr. Penn, that he, I'm arguing that yes, it is about the context of the uh, experience of the, and the, the experience that we're accountable to, but there's something more to that because he is arguing that there is something real that is beyond the human struggle that is moving toward liberation. So that hope becomes, it seems to me, about more than simply the ability to resist and to struggle and to live and to continue in, in that struggle against that which would uh, disavow one's humanity and disavow uh, uh, the, the truth, if you will, and uh, of one's blackness, so that hope becomes something that is real because there is a hope really in an, an already not yet reality of a more just future, of the liberation that is God's. And so it's not winning, it's about a, a victory over that which, a victory over suffering. Here's where we would disagree. So <laughs> I, I would agree with you that God remains real for Cone, but I think there are ways, there are ways in which what he is able to say about God shifts. And so I'd, I'd look at his argument concerning the, uh, theodicy, which is aggressive and robust in God of the oppressed. And there is a shift away from the kind of certainty of presentation within the historical moment you get with God of the oppressed in later writing. And so it seems to me what he's, God remains real, but what he's able to say about God within the context of human history gets modified. And that's what I'm pointing to through <clears throat> Wright and Camus. It's that modification. It's, it's a, so Camus' yes, no proposition, the need to immediately negate all of our affirmations, I see mm -hmm. being played out in how Cohn wrestles over time with the Odyssey. All of the sure enough proclamations he makes against William Jones get softened. The affirmation gets negated. And so you still have God and God is real. Right, and a, a right, sense right. of how God wants to position God's self, but what he is able to say as being affirmed through human experience gets modified. Okay, we, we could go on and, I, and we, I'll, I'll leave it there. I wanna get to a couple of questions in, in the, in, in the uh, chat. Uh, and we just have time for a couple. The, the first one, uh, Tamara asks, says you spoke about humanism creating ritualized experiences that point to more. What would be some ritualist practices for current freedom movements like BLM? Well, I'd like to draw from thinkers like, like Thoreau. I, I find a tremendous amount of inspiration in Walden. And I, I link that to Alice Walker. And my mm. argument would be any activity, right? So think about rituals, repeated activity and founded space. Any activity that recognizes and affirms our rightful occupation of time and space is a ritual that speaks to our personhood and our freedom. It can be as simple as walking with friends in a park. It can be as risky 
as protesting exactly. in a group in front of the police. So again, my argument would be any activity that speaks to our rightful occupation of time and space and authorizes us, urges us to demand our rightful occupation of time and space qualifies as a ritual. And for humanist movement through the world in those ways become a ritual activity that replaces church worship, for example. Yeah. And so, and I like how you say in this regard, right, protest becomes ritual. It is ritual. That's right. And, and so it's not an invention of ritual for BLM. They are already engaged in ritual. Right. So, another question, I think from one of you, uh, perhaps your students, Hassan, says the ah. Cone, <laughs> yeah, and a, and a union alum. Uh, uh, he says that Cone's deep regard for the artist, particularly the significance of the blues, highlighted the work and musical sensibilities of noted improvisationalists like Coltrane, Gillespie, Fitzgerald. Can you speak to the role and function of improvisation as a conceptual frame for thinking radical Black thought and aesthetics generally, and more specifically, how it may inform Black theologies? Yeah, I know who Hassan has been reading lately. Right, so you know where that question came yeah. from. I, I wouldn't necessarily use that language, but what I would point to, again, is the poetic. For me, this is a way of capturing the same posture, the same inclination that Hassan is capturing through improvisation. That in both contexts, it seems to me, what you have taking place is a deconstruction of traditional patterns a kind of openness and creativity that allows for new modes of expression that allows us to see and be sensitive to what had been overlooked. And, and so for Cone, you might see this in terms of blues and jazz. For me, you see this in terms of hip hop. Think in terms of scratching. Or even more recently, modes of, of rap that you know, some folks aren't all that into. I, I have an appreciation for it. Think in terms of mumble rap. There are ways in which mumble rap becomes a significant critique of language and the ability of language to capture and name experience. Good. Right? So, so I wouldn't disagree with that. I would simply name it differently. I would name, yeah, name it poetic. Excellent. Let this will be the last question, and I think it's a good one to, to end on as we come to the close. And my goodness, there's so many questions uh, here uh, that are good. So thank you for such uh, a provocative uh, and thought-provoking uh, lecture and powerful lecture, Dr. Penn. But let's, let's end with this question. Black, uh, this comes from Carol. She says that Black rebels keep being murdered. How can Blackness survive white supremacy, according to Dr. Cohn. <laughs> First, let me say, I'm, you know, I'm sorry we're not gonna be able to get to all the questions, but my email address is easy to find. And if folks send me an email with the question, I will do my best to respond in a timely fashion. Don't call me with it unless you wanna wait six, seven months to get a response. But if you email me, I'll hit you back as soon as I can. I, I, in terms of Cone, if you think about blackness along the lines of a salvific quality, I'm not quite convinced that for Cone, whiteness can wipe out blackness, right? I, I, I think that's by right, its very right. nature, blackness can't be wiped out, but then you've got this added dimension of God coming into play, That's right? True. That we don't label, we don't labor alone, that That's God true. has committed God's self to being on the side of the oppressed and God and our activity safeguards our ultimate being. I, I, I found myself over the past year or so, and I'm wrestling with this sort of question and I'm finding Afro-pessimism really compelling. So I'm, I'm rethinking notions of death. I'm, I'm rethinking 
hope. I'm, I'm rethinking the nature of blackness over against my initial theological inclinations and what Afro-pessimism is forcing me to reconsider. That's very interesting because throughout uh, your talk, there were moments, uh, Dr. Penn, where I said, you know, his next move is, is, is Afro-pessimism. Uh, the, yeah, but the problem here is, right? I mean, there are some obvious differences that I can't get beyond. So the critique and kind of dismissal of humanism within Afro-pessimism right. isn't my vantage point, right? I, I, I think <laughs> humanism along the lines of a kind of black moralism still has some vitality, some usefulness. Well, we look forward as always. I know of no more prolific uh, th black theological uh, humanist thinker and black religious thinker than, than you. And uh, you always leave us with more to think about and you leave us wanting and grasping for that, that, next, that next step. Uh, in our thinking and in our theological and uh, religious thought. And you certainly did that uh, tonight. Uh, uh, and so I want to thank you for a very engaging lecture. And for all of you who have joined us, thank you. And what you saw uh, this evening was not simply the generosity of uh, his thought, but the generosity of Dr. Anthony Penn's person as he invited you to continue to engage with him. What I did not say is uh, earlier is that what I've also come to know and is why I enjoy uh, engaging with him so often uh, is that he is a lifelong learner and he learns from each conversation and invites you into learning uh, with him. So thank you. Dr. Penn, for all thank that you, you give, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your witness. Thank you all for joining us on this evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>